Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Karen Ding, and I'm the president of the Leadership Institute at Harvard College, uh, which is a partner of the um, Kennedy School's Center for Public Leadership. And it's my pleasure, really, to uh, welcome you all to the panel tonight. Um, the Leadership Institute is actually a student group at the college. And we do lots of similar things to, to what CPL does on campus at HKS. Um, and basically just devoted to promoting and developing leadership among undergraduates. Uh, so tonight I'm here as a supporter of CPL and a partner of CPL. So um, I'm happy to talk more about the Leadership Institute with any of you who are interested after the event. Um, but at this time, I really want to go ahead and introduce the convener of tonight's panel, uh, Ty Sunanan, which I'm sure all of you know. Um, but he's been a social involved in social entrepreneurship for all his life. And last fall, uh, led, was instructor of a course on social entrepreneurship at the Kennedy School Center for Public Leadership. Right now, Ty is a doctoral student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where he's really passionate about developing a conceptual framework for social entrepreneurship. There's obviously more information uh, about Ty in the packet and about all of the panelists here tonight in the packet that you should have all picked up on your way in. Um, but I want to go ahead and hand it off to Ty at this point so he can tell you a little bit more about how the event came about and how it's going to work this evening. So. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm really uh, glad that you folks could uh, make it out here tonight. I just briefly wanted to give a context to the event tonight and talk a little bit about uh, uh, sort of the, the panelists, and then we'll get started from there. So really quickly, uh, as Karen mentioned, the class that I taught last year, we decided uh, collectively that we wanted to continue the discussion. And so continuing the discussion vis-a-vis -a, -vis a panel uh, of uh, thought leaders in the field of social entrepreneurship. So that's how this event came about. Uh, so with that, I just want to introduce our distinguished panel here, uh, panelists rather. So we have five individuals uh, that I'm very thankful could make it out this evening uh, from their busy schedules. But I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Mr. Jim Bildner. Uh, uh, Jim Bildner is uh, not only an author, he's a trustee of over 10 foundations, universities, and nonprofits. Um, and by the way, you could read more about each of these individuals in the packet you have, uh, which is their full biographies. Um, and Jim also happens to be a, a mid career here at the Kennedy School of Government um, and also a director of the Center for uh, uh, Applied Philanthropy. Uh, to the left of, of Jim is Gigi Georges, and Ms. Georges is the director for the uh, innovations project here at Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and she's also contributing author to the book we're going to raffle during the break and at the end, uh, The Power of Social Innovation with Stephen Goldsmith uh, and Tim Burke. Uh, to the left of Ms. Georges is uh, Casey uh, Recupero. And Casey is the uh, director of Europe here in Boston. And he's also part of Europe's national leadership team. Uh, to the left of Ms. Recupero is Colette Stanzler, and Colette is the Director of the Social Impact Research for Root Cause, uh, which is a research and consultancy firm uh, based out here in Boston, and she really thinks about uh, the philosophy, the tools, and the services in measuring social impact. And wrapping up the panel, we have Scott um, Warren, who is the Executive Director of Generation Citizen, and he's also a 2010 Equine Green Fellow. So I know most, uh, a lot of you folks are interested about fellowships, and he would be the person to talk to. So with that, we're just going to go ahead and get started down the panel. And Jim, do you want to kick it off for us? Uh, <clears throat> sure. So uh, Ty had sort of asked me to uh, provide sort of the lens in which um, funders and foundations look at social enterprise and the criteria that, that they're looking at. And so. A couple of things that are, I think, fairly obvious, um, but are worth repeating. So context um, is incredibly significant in this discussion now. So um, events in Wisconsin and the federal deficit and um, displacement of sort of critical frontline health and human services, the triage of safety nets, the triage of arts and culture, uh, all represent, I'd say, singular challenges in the greater world of social enterprise. And um, sitting, unfortunately, on top or side, whatever your point of view is, um, has been um, the reconstruction. That would be the most positive way of the financial markets. And um, all of that is a very simplified way of saying that the place in which social entrepreneurs and folks with a vision as to what they want to accomplish enter certainly the capital markets 
and the traditional philanthropic markets is incredibly different today. Um, and the behavior of um, those traditional cornerstones of uh, funding sources is very different today than in almost any other time that I can think of. Um, so capital is precious to us as funders, much more precious than it's ever been. Um, not just because the endowments themselves, whether you're several billion dollar foundation or several hundred million or a few million, uh, the amount of payout, which is typically defined by a 5% payout requirement depending on what your entity is, you can do the math. So if endowments have declined by 30% or a significant number times five, that's a significant amount of capital that's evaporated. Um, the, um, and the space itself, so you do have this juxtaposition of lack of capital and greater demand. Um, so, it, so the good news in the story is that uh, the need for innovative ways of bridging that gap. So there's no silver bullet to satisfy all the needs domestically, let alone internationally. Um, but there are spaces where uh, unique ways of providing services that have sustainability, so earned income, earned revenue streams, um, are all ways in which foundations are looking to leverage their dollars. And I'd say of all of the sort of core insight that I can give you is that uh, speaking now individually, not for the foundations or the boards that I'm on, uh, but speaking from a personal point of view, the days in which we would give grants um, and be satisfied that that fulfilled our responsibility, I think are over, and that we're looking uh, for leverage, but in a very uh, different way, leverage of human capital, leverage of capacity, um, and that the outcomes that we expect for the things that we are funding are very different in terms of wanting to make sure that uh, we're seeing concrete results for those things, that whatever your particular intent is that, in fact, that intent can be served. The amount of due diligence that program officers perform today is materially different, more, um, more holistic. So it's not just check the box. Is this a good mission? Is the management team on the surface good? Is the uh, sector important? Does it meet our mission? But there's a much more comprehensive understanding that even if all those boxes are checked, is what we end up funding and what you end up doing sustainable. So there's, I think, a diminished appetite for what I would call episodic involvement. You know, you got a good idea, it's an important area, but our funding and your activities in and of itself are not going to be uh, either field changing or sector changing or likely to be leveraged or picked up or extended. So um, that is, I'd say, the profound observations, at least, that I can, I can add to this conversation. So Ty asked me to talk a little bit um, about uh, looking at innovation from the perspective of an aspiring innovator or an innovator, and I understand that there are probably a number of those in the audience um, today, tonight. Um, of working, how do you break through the barriers of government? Um, and um, I want to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing, that we're just launching now here at the Kennedy School, and, um, and just throw out a couple of ideas and go from there. Um, so you've got a great idea, and you know that you've reached that, that you've sort of acted on it, you know you've reached that point where you, um, you want and need to scale to reach more people. Um, and you realize quickly that uh, government is the gateway for that. Um, like it or not, government has the money, um, and it's you know it's it's got the monopoly on on, on how to produce the, the services for the greatest number of people. Um, the we all have heard and probably many have experienced the the barriers that you encounter either as an innovator or, frankly, as a citizen um, in trying to work with government or break through, um, break through and become a partner of government. 
you know, government is monopolistic, there's no mar market discipline, it's overly prescriptive uh, in its funding, it has an odyssey of rules and regulations that will take you a lifetime to figure out. Uh, there's favoritism towards incumbent providers for a number of reasons. Um, political uh, momentum and motivations are at play. Um, there is an aversion for, again, obvious reasons to risk and failure. Um, I could go on and on for the rest of the session to talk about that. But um, I'm here to say that there is hope, uh, that it's not um, all lost, and that there have been, and many of you may, some of you may have experienced and seen this, that there have been some really great success stories about partnership between government and um, innovators. Um, what we are um, what we are doing here in the at the Kennedy School, and we're just launching it now with um, with the uh, great and generous support of Bloomberg Philanthropies, um, is focusing, trying to begin to lay some groundwork in a handful of cities around the country. Six cities, six mayors that are particularly interested in breaking through some of those their very own barriers. Um, and promoting of innovation and promoting more cross-sector partnership work, um, but understand either by virtue of trying um, or by virtue of just how they got there um, that this is going to be a very difficult road. Um, and so it is our hope um, not to lead the way for them um, because we are not um, we have neither the, the capacity nor the knowledge or skills to do that but to help them think about how they open some doors, how they, you know, as we like to say, open space for innovation. Um, and help them think about, as well, how they um, not only use uh, levers, regulatory, legal, contractual, um, and the like, but think about, think more concretely about who the stakeholders are, um, who the stakeholders ought to be, and how you always remember that this is about serving citizens and that their voice and their choices um, are paramount in how you make those decisions. Um, so, so those are some of the themes that we're um, trying to build in this very early stage work um, with a handful of mayors um, and, um, and, and just, you know, just as a final couple of points, um, and this is something we could get into in Q&A or in the, in the small group discussion, um, just throw out a few ideas. Um, if you as an innovator are thinking about how you want to break into this, um, where, do you, where, where do you need to be thinking? Number one, um, know that you've got to take on risk. The mayor, the city council leader, they're not going to take on the risk. Um, if you want to partner with government, you need to show that you're willing to take on risk, be accountable for failure, and give the success to the, to the elected official. It's not fair, but it's the way in. Um, and we could talk more about some really great examples, and I'll throw one out. You could just look up, um, it's, in, it's in the book that we worked on with Steve Goldsmith, um, LA uh, Urban League, uh, a guy named Blair Taylor, who's a CEO out there, did some <laughs> really fabulous work in this realm, and um, he got he got the trust. He used the, the credibility of his organization. He got the trust of the community, the trust of the elected officials. He made a bargain with the mayor and the police chief and the head of the schools out there, and he said, "Look, I'll take the blame. Send it to me, but you know you got to have my back in this." And it's a really fascinating story about how they made some tremendous inroads in a 70-block area um, in in the Los Angeles area. A um, couple more, find a powerful champion or champions um, for your work. Um, easier said than done, but um, you know, be persistent about it. Um, does not have to be a champion in government to start. Can be a champion who is an ally, um, a influencer, um, you know, a member of what we call the grass tops, right? Um, find those champions and get them to start being a part of the drum that you're beating about why you ought to be in the game and why you're better than what's there. Um, know your audience and understand, and um, Jim talked a little bit about this in terms of you know understanding your political environment. 
um, understand the environment, understand the motivations of the mayor or the, or the elected leader or the agency head, all of the above. Um, if you understand the audience and you understand the motivations and you get the landscape, you know, for example, in this current environment, you ought to be about doing more with less. Um, you're going to go in and ask for new dollars, you're going to be shown the door. Um, even repurposing dollars in this environment is, is a tough sell. Um, so how are you, how is it, I mean, I'll, I'll just, and then I'll stop, um, just tell a quick story. I had a conversation with the former mayor um, just a few days ago who said to me, you know, it's really very nice that you're doing this work on innovation and it's, you know, great and you're up there at Harvard and, you know, but isn't it all really superfluous in this environment? I mean, really innovation, innovation labs, I mean, we're, we're out there, you know, my, co my former colleagues are out there, you know, cutting to the bone. And I said, you know, and you tell me if you think this makes sense, I said, you know what, now more than ever, right, we need innovation. Because innova it, it's all around how you define the term. And if innovation is about um, figuring out, showing that you can be more effective with fewer dollars, reach more people, and should have better results, then you, in fact, are a part of the solution to this fiscal crisis, a small part, albeit. But you get all those troops lined up, and it can make a difference. And I'll stop there. Great. Uh, so Ty asked me to talk about some things, too. And um, I, I think part of it was kind of talk about Year Up and sort of what we do there. And I realized you guys can all read about Year Up uh, in other places, so we're not going to use time for that now. But I didn't realize there's probably some things that I can take from my experience uh, over the last seven years or so um, that, uh, that could be a, a little bit of kind of helpful prompts for um, innovators in the room, or what I'm going to call social enterprise refiners in the room. Um, so the, the, probably the first place to start is the way I describe my job. Um, you know, on, on one hand, I run a school, right, for 18 and 24 year olds, 300 students a year, uh, and you know, non-traditional students. but. I run a school, but that usually gets people saying, well, are they third graders at a high school? Where's the school? Is the public, private? Um, I, you know, I run a staffing uh, agency for Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000 companies delivering a cost-effective pipeline and pre-trained talent. But that's a whole other uh, kind of idea as well. So I, I started describing this role as being an opportunity broker, right? So ultimately what we're doing is finding those 18 to 24-year-olds who have a huge amount of uh, talent, potential, hustle, uh, smarts, but have zero access in terms of social capital and social networks to get into the knowledge-based economy, and connecting them with uh, 21st century employers who are looking for that uh, talent pipeline right now, even in the midst of a, a pretty terrible economy, because there's you know both sides of that opportunity divide, which by the way is 4.3 million young adults in this country would fit that that kind of disconnected 18 and 24 year old status. Um, you know, both sides are losing, right? So there's a social justice uh, equity issue, which is probably not great for society. If you think about the haves and the have-nots divide getting wider. Um, you know, that in fact, I can talk about our students usually as, hey, these are the guys that if you want to be a cop or a fireman or a small business owner or a nurse or if you want to be a drug dealer, you know, there's pathways to do that. There's professional apprenticeships you can do and you can learn how to deal drugs. But if you want to be a systems administrator at Raytheon or if you want to be a fund accountant at Platinum Investments, you actually have no way to get into that game. And so there's a, is it just a flat out justice issue that we don't, uh, we don't kind of allocate that opportunity equally. But we also have a crushing crisis ahead of us of a shortage of middle skilled uh, labor for the jobs that we're actually gonna have ahead of us. So, you know, despite near double digit unemployment right now, we, we can see that ahead of us. Our system isn't churning out what our economy's gonna need. You've got a competitiveness issue too. So we're happy to be kind of in that space right now uh, because it feels like the, the system's not meeting that need. But we've learned a couple things over the last uh, 10 years. Um, the first is you can scale it. So we started with a first class of 22 students back in 2001. Um, in 2011, we'll serve 1,400 students in nine cities around the country. Um, I met 152 of them this morning. So pre-orientation for our, our class that starts next week just started. Our first group of students in Seattle will start next week. Um, in terms of size, you know, we serve about 300 students a year here in Boston. Um, that's about a third of the size of 18 to 24 year olds who go to Roxbury Community College. So we're, you know, we're probably top five in terms of options if you're 18 to 24 in the city and you're looking for this type of, uh, of opportunity. Um, we've also found that it works. So we, we just got really exciting data back. The white paper probably comes out um, a little later this spring of a longitudinal study we did with the random assignment, statistically significant, gold standard, public policy, you know, kind of all the stuff that's really important that Kennedy School students know better than others is, is actually really hard to do. 
Um, we got, you know, for the first time in 30 or 40 years, we've got a job training program that actually gets measurable results in terms of an impact on earnings. So that came back and told us that uh, you're going to see a 30% increase in earnings uh, for um, attending year up versus not, if you compare that with the randomly assigned control group. So that's great. Um, clearly, the challenge is, well, so then what? Um, and, and so if I think about the role I played at year up, not as the founder, so I joined in year three. Um, so, you know, there's a cult of social entrepreneurship, which is great. We need innovators, we need new ideas. Um, if I think about the role that I played at year up, it really is that social enterprise refiner. So I came on uh, having worked internationally for a number of years with Allison, who, nice to see you. Um, and, uh, and thinking about work with NGOs overseas, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, I came on to deepen, to scale, and sustain something uh, that we started. And if I think about what we've learned, here's, here's a couple. Um, the first one is have a clue and then measure everything. Um, and not just have a clue about you know, what you're going to have for lunch today, have a clue about the meaning of life, but at least have a clue about the, the measure of success uh, that we really care most about. And that could be uh, the definition of success. That could be the way I want a staff and student teachable moment conversation to look like at year up. And then I want to highlight that, I want to role model it, I want to tape it and show it to people and really coach people hard so that we can repeat that over and over and over and over again when you have 250 staff instead of 10. Um, but it could also be, for me, you know, our goal is not a 85% successful outcome target at four months, although that is one thing we measure. My goal is 30-year-olds who have the flexibility and stability in their life to make choices. So if that's our definition of success, we may not be able to measure that well, because that's, you know, that's a 10-year outcome. No one's doing that. But at least with that in mind, then you can sort of hold up innovations and say, hey, is that helping us to get to that 30-year-old um, or not? And you can tweak things, and you can throw them away, and you can mainstream the things that really work, and you can keep innovating on top of that. So it's really important to have that definition. Um, second thing to me is it, it is really all about incentives. Um, you know, someone in the funding community told me one time, imagine there's no money. Um, this was talking about overseas. It's like you can get amazing innovation if you start from a reality of there are zero dollars to fund this. Amazing things happen. I mean, he, was, he was funding a lot of work in India. And he said, God, we just start with everything, saying imagine there's zero. So then when there's something, you can really scale something. Um, so I like that, but you know, there is some money, right? Um, so I'd much rather say, if there is funding there, um, make sure that you've got incentives that are driving people to do things even if you're not paying them for it. Um, so for us, you know, the students that year up, they sign a contract that outlines the professional expectations that I'm going to meet. I'm earning a stipend in addition to college credit while I'm there. And my stipend will go up and down based on whether or not I'm doing that. It helps me build good habits, right? You know, showing up on time, dressing professionally, you're respecting the core values of environment. Those are all things that I'll do if there's some incentives to get me to do it. Um, you can also find that in funding environments, right? You know, I think some of the things that Gigi was talking about, government hasn't always been great at aligning incentives to get the results we want. Um, a year up, man, if we do a bad job, because companies fund about 60% of our cost per student, the, the companies that host our interns um, will quit on us if we do a bad job for a couple of cycles and we'll go out of business, which is great because if we're doing a bad job, we should go out of business. So we've got an incentive to keep our results up for our young people and our companies, both of those customers. Um, and the last one to me um, is be intentional and probably be comfortable uh, that, it's, uh, that there's a changing minds business in addition to the changing lives business. Um, and that's, you know, systems change or influence or indirect impact, whatever the kind of lingo you want to use for that. We realized, man, 4.3 million young adults and you've got 1,400 that you're serving around the country in 2011, boy, what just sounded like a great story sounds like not even scratching the surface, so getting near the bucket. Um, and, uh, and so we say, okay, well, what can you do about that? Um, first of all, don't get discouraged. Um, remember that scaling your social impact isn't the same as scaling, scaling your, your operations. Um, so it doesn't necessarily just mean more sites in more cities serving more young people. There's different ways to think about that impact. Um, and for me, I, I sort of think about it in, in three ways, um, and we think about it in three ways that you're up. There's a, a policy one, which is probably the most natural, right? You know, we've got 1,100 alumni here in Boston. Um, God, those are folks who can actually show up at the state house and change somebody's mind and potentially change a policy. Um, you know, we've got C-level executive, we've got thousands of volunteers, so we've, we've got enough juice that we can actually throw our weight behind something and, and change a policy. Um, to me, one of the, and this is my kind of grassroots organizing history, there's a perception change uh, that is particularly important. If our city, I don't know how many folks think about Boston as their neighborhood as, as opposed to the world as their neighborhood, but if our city, uh, you know, changed its perception about what we think young adults in our, in our city are capable of, um, a lot of things would happen. You know, when you read the kind of terrible story in the Globe and you're saying, you know what, that's true about the achievement gap or this youth violence or name the stat, 
Um, but I also personally know about the story of someone who's working at DNY Mellon right now, or at Tufts Medical Center, or this, and that's gonna change the way I act today. You know, funders would fund better, teachers would teach better, young people would have better role models. Um, you know, companies would definitely hire better if we actually got, got away from the perception change that we're kind of seeing today. Um, and the last one is, is one that we've started playing a little more. Um, you, you guys are familiar with the X Prize, right? You know, kind of lay out a, a crazy set of criteria. You know, this robot needs to be able to walk on Mars with no independent power source and fly back to Earth and do a puzzle. And if you can do that with $10, here's a million bucks. Um, and so for us, there's a prize side of this too, right? So the policy piece we know, the perception piece is there. There's a prize as well. Just say like, hey, what would this look like? Right now, the way the current version of Europe, no matter how successful, is, is created, there's no way that it would ever touch 100,000 young people in this country, um, which, by the way, is still a fraction of that 4.3 million. Um, so hey, happy 10th birthday. What you've got right now, which feels great, actually isn't yet ready for prime time. And so we're now in the mode of, how do you take what you've learned uh, and start thinking about what 2.0 looks like? So we're doing a pilot down in Baltimore where uh, we're basically sharing the load of, of the services we provide with the local community college. So that cuts our cost per student about 40%. Um, we'll see whether we get the same results. If we don't, that's okay. We're probably gonna have to try you know, 10 or 15 of these before we figure out something that might actually work. Um, so as a, as a refiner as opposed to the entrepreneur, um, I think to me it's, it's a lot of the things that you sort of think about of what happens after you get the first, uh, first big hit? How do you kind of keep your staff or what happens when you're two or three staff members on in each position that actually maintains an organization going forward. So happy to talk about that more later too. I'll pass it to Colette. Thanks. So Ty asked me to talk about social impact measurement and um, kind of high level philosophies and challenges that we're facing. Um, and I always have to caveat the social impact with, um, I think it's in very few instances that we can actually measure impact, very rarely, um, but that we're really just trying to even make strides in being able to measure pro uh, program performance and, and outcomes, which Casey spoke a little bit about. So I do have to caveat with that. Um, but just taking a step back, I received my um, MPA here while I was doing a dual degree, getting my MBA. And so this was my first exposure, I came from the finance world, and this was my first exposure to the idea of social entrepreneurship and what is this and the concept of um, using innovation to um, new ideas to address old problems. And I found that really very exciting. Um, and actually, so as Ty mentioned, I work for Social Impact Research, which is the research division of Root Cause, and that stemmed out of a project that I did while I was a graduate student. And what I looked into was, okay, we have all this new field of social entrepreneurship, lots of great ideas, but not a lot of talk around measurement. And I had come from equity <coughs> research in the private sector, and um, so I did a project in, in graduate school looking at why don't we have the same type of rigorous research um, on our social issues and identifying high-performing um, uh, social sector organizations as we do in the private sector. And so um, that's what the research um, department uh, stemmed out of. And so for today, at least right now, and I can go into any more detail about the work that we do in the um, <coughs> small group discussion, but I just want to very briefly touch on, on three points. First is um, the, why is measurement important, particularly um, today. Um, second, the tension between being innovative and measurement. And third, the challenges of real, true effective measurement um, with lack of standards. And so when I started thinking about this idea of research and what if we use the same type of um, methodologies in the social sector as exist in the private sector around um, research, well, how, how did independent research or equity research come about in the private sector? So um, I worked with a team in business school to do some research on that, and we looked back to the tech sector in the late 1970s, and that at that time, there was a huge amount of, of capital to be invested. There was um, considerable innovation, great number of startups, um, of um, technology organizations. There were a lot of investors looking to invest money, but a lack of transparency for those investors on what these new technologies were. People you know, hadn't heard of you know, um, what is software, what is hardware, et cetera. And so thinking about the social sector today, which despite um, 
the you know, recession, difficult economic times, there still is a tremendous amount of money. There are huge number of um, nonprofits, social enterprises, lots of innovation. And now we think there's also a new or different type of um, funder emerging or philanthropist emerging who's really trying to look past just financials and starting to look at program performance and perhaps even outcomes. And so what is missing though, if you look at the analogy between um, equity research in the private sector and um, our social sector, is that transparency and that information to donors from um, social sector organizations. And um, as Jim had mentioned about, you know, capital today is very precious, whether you're a huge foundation or whether you're an individual looking to give $100 away. And people are being, in many cases, more thoughtful or taking the time to learn more about the social issues, more about what matters, and then really doing some basic due diligence on, on where to give um, to organizations. And so that, you know, um, information now and being able to show that um, you're collecting information using that information not just collecting it using it analyzing it making changes based on it and being transparent and reporting it um, I think is very critical as we think about um, at root cause we think about um, use of data and how important measurement is and it's obviously not just for the funders it's first and foremost most critical for the nonprofits and using that information for self-improvement and and with limited resources how do you best allocate the people and the funds that you have the in-kind <coughs> Um, resources that you have. How does management use that information in order to make better strategic decisions um, or recognize where maybe there are opportunities or um, areas within the organization that are not working? And finally, how do you communicate your performance? How do you really leverage that opportunity that you are collecting data, leverage that opportunity to share that with um, key stakeholders? However, you know, particularly as we think about social entrepreneurship, there's always the discussion of innovation, and you want you don't want to stifle that innovation. And if you're a startup and you're being really innovative, it's pretty tricky to um, be um, develop have the money or the resources or the time or have any results to show through um, external evaluation. So we think at, at root cause we've um, thought about the idea of a spectrum where maybe the level of investment is potentially matches up with the stage of development the organization is at and, and what they're um, measuring. So at the startup phase, uh, you know, a few months, a year, two years out of um, the gate, you're, you are collecting selected indicators, key indicators by which you can start tracking what's important to you, your mission, your vision, and making progress against it. And perhaps in a um, philanthropist or funder is then matching their level of investment. It's five thousand dollars based on that phase. Um, then moving up to, okay, well now we have a concept. Um, we've made progress. We have this proof of concept. We are now starting to develop more metrics, developing more financial indicators that we're tracking, organizational um, stability indicators, pro program performance, um, and maybe the level of investment increases. You eventually get to, okay, this is really promising, perhaps not proven yet, but promising, and we should, um, you know, there should be dashboards, we should be collecting a considerable amount of um, indicators and really obviously making changes based on that and showing trends over time. And the last um, is, you know, you know, showing a, a proven success to some degree or hiring external evaluators who are you know, doing in-depth performance measurement, and that might match with the level of investment or the confidence that somebody feels um, with which they can give um, because that has been conducted. But there really needs to be a fine balance in, in our work at Social Impact Research when we're looking at organizations who are addressing the same social issue using, and they're all using the best practices, is to be very careful when we're collecting data to recognize this organization has been around for five years as opposed to 35. Mm -hmm. But they have a strong management team. They have a really innovative way of um, the way that they're doing work. They don't have the same results, and that's important to explain to funders who read our reports that they, they don't have those results yet because they're not there. But if you're, you know, potentially you have a higher um, 
your higher risk tolerance as a philanthropist or a funder or you know considering yourself an investor in that organization that might be the better organization for you than maybe the proven proven organization um, and then the last thing I want to touch on is again making the analogy to the private sector and equity research there it's really straightforward to compare Nike versus Reebok versus any other footwear um, organization based on the indicators that they're tracking um, and and everything is for the most part standardized people use the same terminologies from the um, research side <coughs> um, and the investor side in the social sector it's it's not that way there's um, there's obviously in financials there can be some standardization but we strongly believe that although there are common indicators across different social issues there are issue specific indicators if you're addressing homelessness than if you are preparing children for kindergarten and um, there should be some key standard indicators that funders particularly individual philanthropists who it's not their job um, potentially to do extensive due diligence on organizations but that they can tr they can really see how does one organization compare to another and it may be okay that some organizations data um, is not as compelling that's a reason to learn more about that organization and are there opportunities to potentially help that organization improve but that there should be ways for um, the same way as in private sector <coughs> um, investments there should be ways to to compare organizations so I think you know as has been mentioned here, the investment today is, um, or capital out there, is um, much more precious. People are becoming much more focused, and I think, um, not everybody, but there is a growing <coughs> number of people, particularly in the, the individual um, funders, that are thinking much more about how do I know I'm giving to an effective organization. So that pressure is on innovators beginning today. I think the really positive thing about that is that the field is also growing. There are so many more organizations that are out there to support innovators, support the practi practitioners, both with, um, you know, whether it's um, best practices, whether it's consulting, um, and then there's a lot of um, methodologies and taxonomies and common indicators and different initiatives that are out there to provide a lot of this information as well. So there's a great um, amount of information to be leveraged out there for innovators who are starting. Uh, great. Um, it's, it's great to be here with all these people. I actually, uh, Ty asked me to, to talk about actually starting up a social entrepreneur organization, and it's our organization is Young Generation Citizens Young, and, and I'm pretty young myself, so it's actually really interesting to, to be on this panel because I'm probably learning as much, if not more, than you. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to, to share some stuff with you guys, but you know, this is just one story, and it's, it's great to be on a, on a panel with all them, and this is probably a little less high level than a lot of the stuff that they've been talking about, um, but, but hopefully that, that works all right. Um, I wanted to start off, and then hopefully this will get into a little bit about what Generation Citizen actually does with why I started it. Uh, and we're, when I say that we're, we're new, we've been in operations just over a year, program a little more than two years. So we're really still figuring things out. Uh, so I can pretend that we have everything figured out, but, but in terms of our program model, in terms of our finance model, in terms of our team, it's changing on an everyday basis, uh, which, is, which is exciting and it's also, it's also pretty difficult. Um, but you know, for me, there, there was you know, a passion and, and a need I saw, and I think they came together. I don't, I don't know if anyone starts a social entrepreneur organization because they want to start a social entrepreneur organization. That, that just doesn't really fit together or, or work out. And I definitely did not, you know, get into this thinking, oh, it'd be really fun to start something because, you know, it's, it's fun, but it's not all that fun. Um, and, and for me, I actually, you know, I, I, I grew up all over the place. My dad was in the State Department, and I was also always fascinated by the topic of democracy, which is actually, I mean, it's something that's in the news a lot now, obviously. Uh, but growing up, uh, a story I talk a lot about it is that I had the opportunity to observe uh, the first truly democratic elections in Kenya's history, which happened in, in December of 2002. And, and for me, that experience was so formative. I was going to these rural areas with my father, who was in the Foreign Service, and seeing all these people and how excited they were to make a difference uh, in their country's inception. It was the first time that they 
uh, had a peaceful transfer of power from an opposite from from the incumbent to an opposition leader, uh, and I came here. You know, I came I came to the co college in the states and was very involved in international advocacy because I'd grown up all over the place, uh, but realized that there was a problem in this country in terms of democratic participation, uh, and you know, I was involved in it. A lot of my classmates were involved in it, but. You looked at uh, lower income students, you looked at a lot of the, the urban schools, uh, and there wasn't a lot of political participation. And, and you look at today, you look at all these problems going on in the country, you look at Wisconsin, uh, you look at the budget crisis, you look at healthcare, there's a lot of noise out there, uh, but, but there's not a lot of informed debate from politicians or, or even from, from citizens themselves. Uh, and for me, this started with, with our youth. And if you just look at, I mean, these are statistics, and they don't, they don't tell the truth, but you look at the 2010 midterms, or they tell us truth sometimes. Uh, sorry, I mean to, to say it that quickly. You look at the 2010 midterms, 40% of the overall electorate voted, and 20% and of, of 18 to 29 year olds, which is my generation, voted. That's really low for a country that prides itself on, on being one of the most democratic countries in the world. Um, most democratic countries have more participation. And, and that just, that bothers me from the, the, the landscape that we have a lot of problems and, and it doesn't seem like everyone's participating. But, but it bothered me when I was trying to come up with Generation Citizen that there was this huge aspect, this huge segment of the population that wasn't participating. Um, and so through my international activism, I sort of had this idea of, why don't we take this, this notion of, of youth taking action on issues they care about, and there's a lot of issues that youth can care about in this country, um, and, and have them learn about the political process that way. And why not take it to our schools? And, and one of the lessons there, actually, that, that I talk about is that you, when you have an idea, you sort of, you have to, to take a risk, but you sort of have to not know what you're doing. Um, and so looking back on it now, the fact that I thought I could take this curriculum and go into a school and take time during the school day to implement it, and we also train college students to go into the, to the school day and do that, it's, it doesn't make sense. And I was a college student at the time too, and so the thought that I could go in there, I mean, they, they, it doesn't line up, but I just, I had this idea and thought, well, why don't, you know, why don't we try it out? Uh, and so we did. So, I mean, that's, you know, a, a roundabout way of, of saying, uh, it, it's, you know, again, you don't start an organization, you start an organization, you start an organization because you're passionate about something and you see a need, and, and hopefully we're going to be at a place soon, you know, we're keeping all these lessons in our, in our minds right now. Um, which, which I think is, is important. Hopefully we're going about this the right way. Um, but, you know, I, I, it, it's, 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 a, it's a good space to be in. And, and although it's a challenging time, my point of view right now is if we can make it now, the economy hopefully rebounds, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna be more than okay. Um, and it's forcing us to think really hard about sort of the, the question of, you know, what do you do if you have no money? We don't really have any money, so we're actually addressing that. Um, is, is, you know, hopefully the, when, when, when our pockets get bigger, uh, you know, we have a, a system in place that, you know, that, that, that we can go places. Um, and, you know, Eckling Green has been, has been one form that's helped us out in that. I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, but yeah, I guess my perspective on here is, is you know, the newbie, figuring out all the lessons that we're talking about now. Fantastic. So a lot of information was exchanged. I was wondering if uh, any folks wanted to have a minute to just respond to anything you heard or sort of recap. And yeah. So, I can do 20 in a minute, but I'm going to focus on a minute and try to um, take a polar shift on this, which is, I think if I put everybody here, with the possible exception of Scott, under sodium pentanol and ask them, are there too many nonprofits and are there too many social enterprises, we would all say absolutely. I, I do without the sodium pentanol. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I do it in public and I get a lot of dirty looks. And the other um, truth is that um, I don't have any statistics, and I don't know, maybe you do call it, but there's a mythology that uh, social enterprise startups, which by the way, in many ways and shapes, if you listen to Scott, and if I were to business school at the for-profit startup, they would describe literally verbatim his own experience about, the plain analogy is a great analogy, but there's no distinction between starting up a for-profit small company and starting up a not for profit, small company. All those things are absolutely true. Um, having said that, the mythology that uh, social enterprises fail because of lack of capital is a mythology. The at least equal in impact is uh, lack of human resource capital. So the Scots of the world who are 
flying low to the ground and worried about every single issue lose energy or uh, have a different life way. So I would just postulate that because you've heard that we all, for the most part, agree that the world doesn't need new startups necessarily, that another way of getting at the end game, which is to be impactful, is to actually look at what exists in the world today and figuring out programmatically, you know, do you have another angle on that and leverage existing capacity that's out there? And, um, from both a funder standpoint, from a human energy standpoint, it, it has a much higher probability, in my judgment, to sustain itself. Yeah, and I, I might actually sort of pick up where Jim left off and apply that to um, something that Casey touched on really briefly around this idea of um, you know, you can, there's, there's a, a, a lot of um, there are a lot of lessons in watching this house do it, and it's really interesting, right, to see to see how that's all coming together and, um, and hopefully succeeding in the long term. Um, but the other piece of this from not an individualistic organizational point of view, but from a larger systemic point of view, is that um, if you can figure out how to coalesce with like-minded organizations um, and focus on how you change, so let's use the government example, policies, right, by, you know, coalescing, being united in one voice, figuring out how you're gonna advocate, um, telling the great stories, and giving the great data, both equally in turn, um, that 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 is a really important systemic piece of um, what you're trying, getting to where you want to go, which is ultimately helping the greatest number of people um, help themselves. And um, and and it's I mean it's interesting because it's really exciting to hear the individualistic organizational pieces. But going back to what Jim said, there are a whole lot of nonprofits out there. There are too many nonprofits out there. You know, one one way to take advantage of that is figure out how to get together and be like-minded and speak with one voice about changing policies. That is the biggest barrier to success. So I want to thank the panelists as a group. Uh, really looking forward to hearing what uh, you folks have to say in the small groups. Hi,